thank you so much. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is David Kirkpatrick. I am very eager to welcome you to the Connect to Include, Include to Connect session, uh, which, as you probably know, is the second stop on the Road to Addis series of events, which will lead up to the World Telecommunication Development Conference WTDC 2021 in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, this coming November. Um, this session is very much about the people of the world and how they will participate and need to participate and can participate in the globally connected society. And it really is a, a way of really helping us better understand the human side of the ITU, which we often think of as very much about uh, speeds and speeds and different kinds of phones and networks, etc. But here we're talking about people and how they can be included. So as I said, my name is David Kirkpatrick. I'm a journalist based in New York. I run a company called Techonomy, which puts on conferences. And I'm very proud to be working very closely with the ITU, which I'm a very strong supporter of uh, on this series of events. So I'd like to tell you a few things about the technical details of today's session because the, it, it, it will take just a little bit of understanding. Um, it's entirely remote, as we all know, we're living remote. It's webcasted, live streamed and recorded. Um, as a participant, you are free to use the chat during the session at any time for any comments you have. Um, questions that are addressed to speakers should be inserted in the Q&A function. And if time allows, we will address some of these questions. You can upvote a question by clicking the thumbs up icon next to a question and Zoom will automatically sort them by the number of upvotes. Um, during the session, we also will be providing captioning services so that you can activate by clicking on closed caption in the bottom bar of the Zoom interface. So you should see closed caption as an option there and you can read that if you'd like to. We also will be providing interpretation in Arabic, English, French, Russian, Chinese, and Spanish, and as you can see, international sign language. Uh, the sign language interpreters will be on screen throughout the session. Um, to listen to the available interpretation channels, please click on interpretation at the bottom right of on the Zoom interface bar at the bottom uh, and select the language you'd like to hear. If you want to hear the original audio, you can select off in the interpretation menu. Off simply means floor as if you were sitting in the room with the speakers. Um, participants in a language channel will hear the translated audio and also the original audio at a lower volume. To hear only the interpreted language, click mute original audio. So there are the housekeeping uh, points. Now, I would, I'm very eager to introduce our incredible group of speakers today, uh, especially our featured keynote speaker, uh, Her Excellency Ms. Salework Zude, President of the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia. We're very pleased to have her joining us. Um, in addition, our speakers will be Otman Almoavar, the research lead at the MISC Foundation, uh, Doreen Bogdan Martin, the director of the ITU Telecommunication Development Bureau, Monica Duhem, CEO of Here Colors, Professor Anthony Giannoumis, who's associate professor of Universal Design of Information and Communication Technology at Oslo Metropolitan University, Lizette Gonzalez Romero from the Telecommunications Indigenous Communities of Mexico, Claudia Gordon, Director of Government and Compliance with T-Mobile Accessibility, Michael Hoden, who is CEO of the Global Coalition on Aging, uh, Fumzile Mlambo Nkuka, the United Nations Undersecretary General and Executive Director of UN Women, very pleased to have her with us, Joanne O'Reardon, activist and sports journalist, Emilce Portillo, 
from Conatel in Paraguay. Emma Randall, who's a youth engagement representative at the ITU. Hans Vestberg, chairman and CEO of Verizon Communications. Roland White, director for global diversity and inclusion at Microsoft. Judith Williams, who's head of people sustainability and a senior vice president and chief diversity and inclusion officer at SAP. And finally, Jim Rogers, <clears throat> our graphic designer and illustrator for the Road to Addis events. Jim will be composing a graphic illustration of the discussion today. And we will join him at the end and he will show us the image uh, that he has done uh, to, throughout this session, which will illustrate as much as possible of all the wonderful things you're about to hear. So now let me pass the floor to my co-moderator, Sango. Thank you, David. Hi everyone, I'm Sango and I'm the child online protection mascot. I keep children safe online. Now, I would like you to meet Danola, our youth community leader. Hi, Danola. What are you up to? <laughs> Hello, Sango. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Danola, and I work with um, the Generation Connect community, which is basically the ITU's work with young people. So if you have any questions or any comments during the session, please use um, hashtag Road to Addis and um, hashtag ITUWTDC. Um, on your tweets and also you can feel free to add the generation hashtag. Thank you over to you David and Sango. <laughs> Thank you Sango and Danola. Uh, and now it's my pleasure to give the floor to Doreen Bogdan Martin for her opening remarks. Take it away Doreen. Thank you David. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening everyone and welcome to Connect to Include, Include to Connect. Our next stop on the road to Addis and, and really happy that our discussion today is part of the Commission on the Status of Women. Uh, it's also part of the WISIS Forum 2021. Today's theme is digital inclusion and I think it could hardly be more timely. Our post-COVID world, in our post-COVID world, digital exclusion increasingly means economic exclusion. It means social exclusion. It means educational exclusion and exclusion from a whole raft of new opportunities that those of us that are already connected take for granted. Digital exclusion particularly affects rural and remote dwellers and also impacts certain demographics more than others. In our session today, we're gonna to look at strategies to drive the digital inclusion not only of women and girls and young people, but also of other marginalized groups like the elderly, persons with disabilities, children, indigenous groups, and people living in remote areas. <clears throat> so what concrete actions are needed to ensure inclusive equal access and use of ICTs for all? Which countries, private sector companies and international organizations are leading the way? What types of partnerships and global cooperation efforts are proving most effective? We have an exceptional panel of experts as you've just heard from, from David, and I'm really looking forward to hearing your views. We also have this great representation of, of youth groups following the discussion. And today we're launching our Generation Connect Visionaries Board, which is our, our new youth consultation committee. This new board comprises eight competitively recruited youth experts and eight high level appointees that are gonna help us to provide strategic guidance to ITU and to ensure that we champion the voice of youth to advance digital development. Ladies and gentlemen, as you know, WTDC will be hosted in Addis Ababa as David just mentioned. And it is therefore my great pleasure and my honor to invite the Honorable President of Ethiopia, Her Excellency, Madam Sahele Workswede, to address us today. Madam President, I give you the floor. Over to you. Thank you so very much. It's a pleasure to see many friends uh, in this uh, call, and I would like to greet you all, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great, with a great pleasure that I welcome you all as we open the Road to Addis series 
of events to shape the 2021 digital development agenda. Digital technology is one of the core enablers in the path towards a brighter, more resilient and inclusive future. In these exceptional times that we live in, digital technology can radically transform lives and help the world rapidly recover for what has been lost due to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, the road to technological advancement is made challenging, especially in developing countries such as ours because of many factors. Chief among the challenges is the ever-growing inequalities within our communities. This disparity manifests itself in terms of access to affordable and high quality technology, as well as the know-how and education in utilizing digital technologies. Because of this, we find ourselves unable to improve the quality of life of our people and using digital technology to ensure social, political, and economic development. Therefore, the concept of digital inclusion is of paramount importance to Ethiopia. Digital inclusion, as you know, has two basic underlying concepts, Accept, access to affordable and high quality technology and the digital literacy competency that is needed to utilize the technology efficiently. As a concept, inclusion or inclusivity is a mindset and a perspective that needs to be a lens through which we see our every activity, especially digital transformation activities. As such, projects, programs, regulations, systems, and more specifically, digital skills and competency development programs should all be seen through the lens of inclusivity and ensure that no one is left behind. However, it remains a sad reality that half of the planet remains unconnected and doesn't benefit from the facilities and services provided by digital technology. The gender gap in global internet usage is a stark example of how digital divides reflect and amplify existing social, cultural, more men use the internet than women. Therefore, inclusion is in itself a goal in addition to being a powerful enabler. Leaving no one behind in the digital world means ensuring that technology is people-centered. This encompasses that no one is offline due to the lack of connectivity or due to the lack of accessibility of the digital transformation products and services. This session of the Road to Addis series that we are launching today aims to address the specific needs of digital inclusion of women and girls, youth and elderly, persons with disabilities, children, and people living in remote areas to achieve true and meaningful universal connectivity. As a milestone, the Connect2 include session will provide all the necessary answers to ensure that no one is left out in this movement for bridging the digital divide and gender gap with the transformative powers of information technology. Ethiopia's first ever digital strategy, Digital Ethiopia 2025, has inclusive prosperity as one of its aim of its main objectives. The strategy mainstreams inclusivity in every activities and projects of the uh, strategy. Ethiopia is committed to digital inclusion in many ways, among which is ensuring the connectivity is a reality for every citizen within its borders. To achieve this, Ethiopia is embarking upon a series of bold reforms to accelerate development in the technology sector. Let me share two primary reforms briefly that the government is currently working on. These reforms are at various stages of development and the National Telecommunications Regulator 
Ethiopian Telecommunications Authority has been set up to oversee and drive them. One of the reform is for the sector liberalization. The government has announced its intention to liberalize the telecom sector and the process is underway. The second is reform for infrastructure and service separation for Ethio Telecom. Separation of infrastructure and first service wings of Ethio Telecom is being considered to leverage cost and management efficiencies. By taking such bold innovative steps, Ethiopia will address critical gaps through high level political involvement to develop comprehensive roadmap and regulations for the telecom sector, including for telecom sector uh, liberalization I spoke earlier. In conclusion, observing the range of participants this event brings together, I believe that various per perspectives and voices are represented and the collective wisdom required to untangle the complex digital inclusion problems is present. I'm certain that this event and the series of events that uh, it is uh, preceding will not only produce solutions, but also draw out practical avenues for their timely and effective implementation of uh, our digital inclusion agenda. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the organizers from all corners of the globe and look forward to welcoming you all to Ethiopia, the first African nation to host the World Telecommunication Development Conference event in November 2021. See you then, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. It's an honor to have you with us today. Um, so we are gonna do a little poll quickly now just to break the ice and test your knowledge about some of the topics we'll be discussing. So the first question, of the total world population, how many currently live with some form of disability? 200 million, 500 million, 750 million, or over 1 billion? The second question, how many young people below 25 do not have fixed broadband internet access at home? 500 million, 1.3 billion, 2.2 billion, or 3 billion, which I think may not yet be on your screen. I'll give you a second to answer those. Well, I'll go ahead and read the third question. Of the 3.7 billion people currently unconnected, how many do you think are women? 1.3 billion, 1.8 billion, 2 billion, or 2.5 billion? So we're gonna give you just a second to answer the questions, and then I'll tell you uh, what the right answer is. Uh, we'll see how, what you thought. So go ahead and select an answer for each of those three questions. Shall we see the results? Okay, well, uh, you're a pretty well-informed group. The majority of you said 1 billion for the first question and that was the correct answer. Uh, 1 billion people in the world currently live with some form of disability. Um, for the second question, uh, you also, the majority of you also got it right. 2.2 um, billion people below 25 do not have fixed broadband internet access at home. And on the final question about women, of the unconnected people in the world, you were, I guess, a little bit more pessimistic than necessary. It's still a terrible figure of 2 billion but it's not two and a half billion. So there's a little bit of good news. Um, and to give us a little more data, um, we're gonna go to the data room with Doreen, who's gonna tell us a little more about the facts and figures of digital inclusion. Thank you, thank you, David. 
uh, of course, data is vital to effective decision making, especially when we're trying to address the needs of specific target groups. There is an urban rural divide in access and use of ICTs, part of its infrastructure. Globally, 95% of people living in urban areas have access to 4G networks, but only 71% in rural areas. But the divide is not only about infrastructure. Globally, 72% of households in urban areas have access to the internet at home, compared with only 37% in rural areas. In LDCs, these figures stand at 25% and 10% respectively. But in addition to the urban rural divide, there's also an access versus a usage divide. This tells us that there are more factors at play and the president herself mentioned some of them. Factors like affordability, digital skills, content and level of education. So let's look now at that usage. We know that young people are enthusiastic embracers of the internet and our numbers confirm that. Globally, around 51% of people are using the internet, but among the 15 to 24 year olds in places where connectivity is available and affordable, this figure is almost 70%. This is encouraging, especially in view of the fact that we have this fast growing youth demographic in much of the developing world, where of course digital technologies have tremendous potential to become a major accelerator of economic growth and of course an important driver towards the SDGs. Another well-known divide is the gender divide. Of course, this is a critical topic as we meet here during the Commission on the Status of Women. Globally, 48% of all women were using the internet in 2019 compared to 55% of all men. And in developed countries, the gap has almost disappeared, but in developing countries, there's still a substantial gap and it gets bigger in LDCs. But last but not least, I come to another divide that we all saw growing at an accelerated pace during the pandemic. It's the learning divide. And personally, I find this one very troubling. At the peak of the pandemic, more than 190 countries closed the doors of their schools to 94% of the learners worldwide, creating the largest mass disruption of education in history. Many governments did an overnight shift to online learning, but the reality is that globally, two in three children and young people don't have fixed broadband access at home to continue their education. As I mentioned before, data is critical and lack of data continues to represent a major hurdle for public policy development. Data tells us where we were, where we are, and where we ought to be. We need more and better data and targets for digital connectivity and affordability, but also metrics to measure the digital inclusion of all groups. We also need to link data to people. As the president said, we need to be people centered and to real stories like the ones we're gonna hear from our amazing panelists today. And without further ado, David, back over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Doreen. Um, let's now turn to our panelists um, to start sharing their experiences. <clears throat> we're gonna start with Emilce Portillo, who is joining us from Paraguay and will be speaking in Spanish. <clears throat> Let me remind you that interpretation is available, so you must switch to the English channel if you wish to continue listening to the session in English, and you'll see there's an interpretation um, control in the lower right of the bottom bar of your Zoom interface. So Emil say, how, what would your life look like without access to ICTs? Antes que nada, muy buenos días y buenas tardes a todos. Y para proseguir con la respuesta, eh, considero que mi vida sin TIC sería limitada. Y lo digo porque al imaginarme ese escenario, eh, me veo 
eh, privada de acceder de manera rápida a la información, así como a las múltiples fuentes de conocimiento, eh, creo que no tendría motivación a la investigación, la innovación, la creatividad. Eh, no podría comunicarme con facilidad con las personas de mi entorno, así como con personas del exterior. Y en cuanto al acceso a la educación, eh, mis probabilidades de adquirir y desarrollar nuevas habilidades técnicas eh, se verían reducidas. Y si por otra parte, a este escenario imaginario, eh, considero una condición o incorporo una condición de pertenecer a una comunidad indígena o simplemente vivir en el interior de mi país, eh, esto se convertiría en una barrera más. ¿Y por qué digo esto? Porque mi país cuenta con dos idiomas oficiales, uno es el español y otro es el guaraní. Y hago referencia a esto porque aproximadamente el 87% de la población de Paraguay habla el idioma guaraní, se comunica en guaraní. Y claro, esto se acentúa más en el interior del país. Y en este contexto yo creo que me sentiría aislada y privada del derecho de acceder a las oportunidades que me ayudarían a mejorar mi calidad de vida. Con ello quiero eh, resaltar lo siguiente, que si bien yo me estoy imaginando este escenario, hay otras personas, tanto en mi país como en otros tantos países, que quizás este escenario sea una realidad. Y finalmente, y en definitiva, creo que sin TIC no hubiera tenido la oportunidad de adquirir nuevas habilidades y no hubiera podido participar del programa America's Girls Can Code, en el cual tuve la oportunidad de aprender a crear y programar una app para el sistema operativo Android, lo cual resultó ser una experiencia extraordinaria y bastante enriquecedora. Y también no hubiera sido posible compartir con ustedes hoy. Muchas gracias y cedo nuevamente la palabra a, da a David. Thank you, Emil Say. Uh, let me ask the same question to uh, Emma Randall, who is the ITU youth representative. So Emma, for you, what would life look like without access to ICTs? Hello, everyone, and thank you for having me today. My name is Emma Jane Randall, and I'm a 23-year-old master's student from Canada with a degree in mechanical engineering. My life without ICTs would be unrecognizable from how it is currently for many reasons. But today I want to talk just about three, socializing, education, and work opportunities. Firstly, like many young people, my social life is heavily reliant on ICTs, especially right now as a result of the global pandemic. Whether this be texting a friend to meet up for a walk or organizing a virtual board game event with my family around the world, ICTs help me to stay connected to the people I care about. Also, without social media, many young people, including myself, would lose our platforms where we communicate both on a personal level as well as with larger communities. Thinking about the value ICTs have to help us engage with larger communities leads me to education. ICTs provide us with access to a boundless amount of growing knowledge and global insight. As an engineer and a student, I use ICTs every day. In fact, my university just passed the one-year milestone of operating almost completely remotely. This past year has shown that although we all know ICTs are not always a perfect substitute for in-person, they can enable remote education, which is crucial right now to keeping students engaged. Not having ICTs would impact everyone, but especially young people with developing interests, skills, and values. Building on this, ICTs facilitate innovative employment opportunities. Personally, without ICTs, I would not be able to participate in my current job, as, my, as most of my colleagues are based in Geneva and I'm based in Canada. I really enjoy working with the ITU as part of the Generation Connect team. Every day I'm seeing how ICTs can empower youth to help solve the problems of the world and work towards achieving the sustainable development goals. Young people right now are growing up in a digital world and it is essential that we have meaningful, continual impact on the development of this world. The work that ITU is doing is vital to making this a reality and I am so excited to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emma. Um, now I'd like to ask Joanna O'Reardon the same question. Joanna is somebody who knows a lot about overcoming barriers. So Joanne, what would your life be like without access to ICTs? Yeah, thanks, David. And thanks for everyone for inviting me here. Um, 
So I was born with a rare condition known as total amelia, meaning I was born without all of my limbs. Um, so I went to school like a normal child. My parents made sure everything was uh, drawn to plan. And at around the age of eight, I learned that I had to go onto a computer in order to complete my work. So I had to learn how to type. And I do that simply with a big biro here. Um, and I put it into my mouth and I bang away on the keyboard. So at the minute, I can type 42 words a minute. Um, I had to learn how to basically code, which wasn't cool for an eight-year-old in 2004. Um, a woman by the name of Christine O'Mahony, she did not know me at all. She developed an entire software that we now take for granted. So she was one of the first people in the island of Ireland to put together hyperlinks. She was the first person to put textbooks on Adobe Acrobat. And she was the first person to install basically Microsoft Word for every school so that every student could upload their work um, in that format. So that didn't exist in 2004. So now in schools, when I see my cousins come home with iPads and they're doing their work and I see all the cool stuff they're doing, a part of me is incredibly jealous. Uh, but I suppose for me, technology has opened up endless opportunities. I can connect uh, to the likes of you um, all around the world. Uh, now with obviously COVID-19, I can continue to drive home the mission of access, access into employment, access into education, access into healthcare. And as Doreen mentioned earlier, I'm actually one of the, uh, I think it was 75% of rural people in the world who don't have direct access to broadband. So for the first time in my nine years, since I last appeared at the United Nations, I had no voice. I was cut off. I couldn't drive home my mission of access. So I had to move basically into the town center um, to get new Wi-Fi. And I suppose my mission and I suppose my ask for everyone here today is to understand that I think as we move into the future, broadband is going to be as vital to the social and economic advancement like motorways were or dams or electricity were in similar eras. And I think similar to the 20th century, we need to make sure that national planning and public and private sector investments are involved. In Ireland, I saw a school in Dublin invest uh, an entire 2.2 million into an online uh, online resource program for teaching. Now, 2.2 million is not something we have in the bank every day. And turns out that was a fee paying school. So I would encourage everyone here to make sure it's accessible. I would encourage everyone to make sure that the investment is done correctly. And I would encourage those that who are putting in the investment into digital infrastructure to um, make sure that there are no unfair disparities and to create a human interaction so that when people are given the tech that they have someone they can go back to and say, listen, I don't know how to copy and paste or anything like that. So I think that's for me the most important thing. Wow, Joanne, eloquent. You're a great exponent of these issues. Thank you for that. Um, next, I would like to ask, uh, we're going to go to a couple of speakers who will get a chance to comment on anything they've heard. And I'll also ask each of them a specific question. And I'm going to start with someone we're especially honored to have with us, the UN Undersecretary General and Executary, Executive Director of UN Women, Fumzile Mlambunguka. So Fumzile, um, what's the social and economic impact of having more women online? And also feel free to comment on anything you've heard from our other speakers. Thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, greetings to everyone. Thank you so much to these brilliant speakers who have just uh, spoken. Uh, I feel like I have nothing to say <laughs> because everybody has uh, made such important points. Uh, thank you so much for giving us uh, so much evidence uh, on the importance of the subject we are discussing today. Uh, for women and girls uh, to be online is a critical uh, enabler for social and economic uh, transformation and development because uh, they can access information if they have uh, uh, if they are connected and they can access education and they can access services as Doreen pointed out access to education is really one area that is troubling all of us we feel that it is important that you do everything not to have a a lost generation after we worked so hard in the last two decades, especially to bring girls to school and to make sure that they complete their uh, uh, secondary education. Uh, of course, there's access to services such as uh, grants from government. 
uh, health services. And we also know that uh, in particular, uh, young adults, women use the internet a lot uh, for their small businesses, their promotion and different ways of uh, uh, earning uh, 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 some, some income. Online mobile money also is very uh, important. It is important, especially uh, for low income users as well as young people and, and entrepreneurs and uh, women's financial autonomy. When women are financially autonomous, they also can escape uh, gender-based violence. So this is a lifeline to really staying alive in some cases. Uh, right now, 1.7 billion people, more than half of whom are women, remain financially excluded from the digital economy. This can mean essential cash transfer program do not reach the women. Think of women who, who depend on cash uh, uh, that is sent to them by uh, members of their family who are working abroad, who live on remittances. And also think of those uh, uh, refugees also, who also depend on some transfers that are coming from people who give them support. So this whole area of banking is potentially one big area uh, for all of us. UN Women has just joined Best Better Cash Alliance in order to help change uh, in financial inclusion. Technology is also life-saving. Numerous stories about how women were able to use a cell phone when they were at risk of being killed, experiencing violence against women in order to summon for help. And of course, we also want to make sure that we alert both women, children, and everyone who we are encouraging to connect about the dangers and as well as uh, staying connected about uh, paying attention to fake news and false information because especially in health, health disinformation is not without victims. So we need to be really vigilant to make sure that uh, we intervene where we see uh, uh, health disinformation. Uh, 450, 433 million women are unconnected in middle and low income countries. And 165 million fewer women are on mobile phone compared with men. Again, that is a gap for us to attend to. And of course, the global internet gap is at 17%. The COVID-19 is the first major pandemic on the social media age. I just want us who are here on this platform right now, if we were not connected in this pandemic, where would we have been? And I think that just answers the question of how important the, the, the moment is. So you can imagine those people who are not connected because those people exist who have lived through this pandemic without the benefit of connectivity. So we all have to roll up our sleeves in generation equality. We are hoping that many of you will be with us where we are intending to work to do our best to fast track the closing of the, of the, gap, of the gender gap, digital gender gap in all its dimension. Digital education, I mean, generation equality is also critical for, make sure, for making sure that we continuously encourage governments and give them evidence that will show them uh, where the gaps exist and where uh, we need to make haste. Uh, we are glad that ITU is part of Generation Equality together with UNICEF from the UN family and many other private sector and civil society partners. Uh, hopefully we will be seeing you again in the different activities, both on the road and in Addis, as well as in generation inequality. Thank you. Thank you so much from Zile. Um, and I think the, the, the presence of the five very impressive women on the screen right now is testimony to something. It's good that I'm the only guy here, aside from our highly energetic interpreter. Um, next, I'd like to ask Judith Williams, who is a major business leader uh, at SAP, what the could, what is the contribution that diversity makes to SAP as an organization? So welcome and, and also feel free to comment on anything you've heard, Judith. Thank you so much. 
Thank you very much, David, and thank you for having me. At, at SAP, diversity is for us a driver of innovation, and we have set a target to be the most inclusive software company on the planet. And our mission at SAP is to make the world run better and improve people's lives. And we're only able to do that if we have a diverse and inclusive workforce where we empower people to run at their best. And so what that means is we have over 150 nationalities represented at SAP. We have over 400,000 customers globally. And if we are going to do service to our customers, we have to make sure that our workforce is going to reflect those customers. Uh, and we think about that not only in terms of the demographics and making sure that we have a proactive sourcing strategy for folk, for women, for people of color, for different geographies, but also in how we think about the accessibility of our products. We have a roadmap to make sure that every one of our products is fully accessible to those who, uh, who might have disabilities. We also extend that to our workplace accessibility because we know we're going to have colleagues who have different challenges and may need accommodations to be successful at SAP. So my team is tasked with making sure that we have a standard for workplace accessibility. We also have some special programs to bring different types of uh, talent into SAP. One program we're particularly proud of is our Autism at Work program. And this is a program that we've had in place since 2014. And we look at it as a program which removes the barriers for success for people with autism to join us at SAP. So we've thought about our hiring process, we've thought about our onboarding process, and also how we support our employees with autism so that they can be successful. And we think about this as not a program that we are giving value to the, the community of people with autism, but an under leveraged talent source that brings great value to us at SAP. And in fact, in, in 2019, uh, or every year we give our, our, our uh, Hasso Plattner Founders Award for Innovation. And the winner um, in 2020 was actually a young man who came in through our Autism at Work program. Imagine the innovation we would have missed out on had we not had this view that people need to, uh, that we need to look at everyone. The talent uh, is evenly distributed among populations, even if opportunity is not. And it's not, um, and I, I would say another area where, where we've really focused at SAP is on promoting the careers of women and also providing digital education to young girls. Our CSR strategy is all about extending digital education globally, primarily to young girls, but also to underserved communities. And then we think a lot about recruiting uh, early talent uh, onto more senior talent, making sure that we have a target uh, to have gender equity. We have a target to reach gender under parity at SAP by 2030, and that's all of our workforce. Uh, we also have an, some intermediate goals. We want to get to 30% women in leadership by the end of 2022. So we set ambitious targets, we build an inclusive workplace, and we make sure that we communicate that diversity is our reality, inclusion is a choice. And we ask all of our employees to make this choice every day. And that's really what differentiates us and makes us an innovative company. Wow, Judith, thank you so much. That was impressive stuff. And SAP has been a leader in many of these areas for a long time. So great to hear from you. Uh, now, another business leader from a major tech company, uh, Claudia Garden of T-Mobile Accessibility. So Claudia, how does T-Mobile Accessibility help people with disabilities gain access to uh, ICTs and, and technology. Great, let me just say first, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> it's bright and early my time in the US. <laughs> I'm in Washington, DC, and it's nice and early in the morning. Before I answer the question that you asked, I want to touch very briefly on the prior discussion. We, when people were talking about life without ICT, as a deaf person, that is so striking to me. I can't imagine life without these tools. And also I grew up on the island of Jamaica. So thinking about that and my background, Jamaica is still considered a developing country. I go back every year and I can see that disparity or gap there. 
when I compare life there to my life in America, it's so different. So I think we need to recognize it's very important. Access to ICT is more than just a privilege. I think it should be cons considered a right, especially for those with disabilities. ICTs empower us, as everyone else on the panel has said. ICTs give us a sense of independence. We are independent because of these. We're able to access information. We're able to make informed decisions because of ICTs. Without access to ICT, I probably would not be able to achieve my educational aspirations. I wouldn't have been able to become an attorney. I also gain access to gainful employment. And there are so many people around the world today who are in the same position as me and really need ICTs for these critical skills. We need to think not only about high tech, but also low tech. For example, my home country of Jamaica, there's still no captioning on television programs there. So imagine during the pandemic, life-saving health information has been shared nightly on the news breaking news, pref, press briefings, but there's no access for those who are deaf, hard of hearing or deaf blind because that information isn't captioned. So during this entire pandemic, that's been an issue. When we consider ICTs, I think we need to consider them broadly and think about all types of disabilities. And then finally, we must innovate not for people with disabilities, but with people with disabilities. People with disabilities know what solutions work for them and we need to be included. I've seen some innovations, for example, there are some gloves that are supposed to be able to read sign language and deaf people who use sign language kind of looked at that and thought, okay, who developed this? <laughs> you know, it's just, obviously it wasn't inclusive. I, and you want to be respectful, but at the same time, we go, okay, I don't think that will work, yet how much time and resources were put into that? I've lost the audio. Can others hear the audio? Please innovate with people with disabilities as opposed to just, um, and one moment, the audio went out. Is it back on now, testing? It, it's on now. I think we missed about 15 or 20 seconds. And this is Claudia speaking. Okay, I apologize for that. I'll answer your question now. T-Mobile is very, I'm so proud to work for T-Mobile. It is so committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion as a corporation. And they include people with disabilities as part of the equation. There are several things that T-Mobile is doing and has done. We provide a wide range of products and services that break down or reduce communication barriers for individuals who are deaf, hard of hearing, deaf blind, have speech disabilities or intellectual disabilities. For example, we have caption telephones. These are good for people who may be older and have a hearing loss, but still want to use a traditional telephone. So they miss some of what's heard on the phone but they can read what was said while they're listening to it. We also provide some traditional services in traditional forms. We have internet protocol relay. This is using an intermediary who I as a deaf person would call that agent or operator, communication assistant. I would give them the telephone number of the person that I wanted to reach on the phone. And then that intermediary would relay that call between the two parties. 
deaf blind people can also make phone calls using this service and it's compatible with braille readers. So deaf blind people are particularly dependent on that service. Video relay service obviously requires sight. So someone without sight can't use video relay service. We provide conference captioning services. An example of that is let's say, especially during the pandemic, pandemic when everyone was working remotely, this service allows remote workers to participate in conference calls with captions. I could go on and on. Um, here in the US, we have the FCC, the Federal Communication Commission. Um, and we also have the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Title four of that requires 24 seven relay service. So it must be available at all times. That's to bring functional equivalency and functional access to people with a disability because people with disabilities need access on par to those without disabilities to the telecommunications infrastructure. So we have a wide range of products and services and these are free to our end users because they're funded through a centralized fund here in the US. And that's managed by the Federal Communications Commission, which I recently mentioned. So an important point, I think when we think about ICT and think about cost, the cost must be affordable. I mean, growing up, <laughs> I moved from Jamaica to New York. I never got a captioning box for the television. Captioning wasn't built into televisions like it is today. I got my first captioning box when I was 18. My mom couldn't afford it before that. And then I got my first TTY machine to make telephone calls when I was 20. I was living in New York City, but I was from a poor family. So technology was not affordable to us. So I'm very thankful to the Americans with Disabilities Act. Individuals who need access like this now can get these tools free of cost. And then I had one final point I wanted to make. When we talk about the digital divide, there's a project that we are very proud of at T-Mobile called the 10 Million Project. It's an initiative to end that gap between school and home and that digital divide. There are millions of households now with children, about 15% who do not have internet access. So this 10 million project is set up to invest, $10.7 million will be invested to provide free Wi-Fi. So we're providing free hotspots. So these families who are eligible can qualify for the program and get this internet access. So many of these families, you know, include children or young adults with disabilities. If you'd like to learn more about that project, please go online, just Google that project 10 million because we're very, very proud of that. And last but not least, <laughs> we are on the road to being the largest 5G provider. And once 5G is available, so many ICT possibilities will have doors open. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Claudia. What an incredible segment. Every one of you said fantastic things. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, so now we're gonna move into a quick segment where we're gonna look at a short video on the digital inclusion of indigenous people. So let's roll that video. Leaving no one behind means ensuring that technology is people-centered and developed from the bottom up. In compliance with universal design and catering for the abilities and needs of all communities, including those of the elderly and indigenous peoples. Muchas veces eh, estas tecnologías llegan como a, a posicionarse en, dentro de las comunidades sin considerar mucho las formas propias ¿no? de, de saber, de sentir, de conocer, de intercambiar. Digital inclusion is a goal in itself and also a powerful enabler. When technology is built and deployed, considering the needs and values of these communities, 
it could become a transformative voice for cultural preservation, self-determination and empowerment. Este, este proceso de formación aporta a mi comunidad a través de mi persona los conocimientos de alguna manera básicos, ¿no? de entrada, de inicio, para que no tengamos como comunidad que estar eh, dependiendo de alguien más, sobre todo de fuera. Technology needs to be put into the hands of the people who are going to use it. But for that, training and capacity building are key. ITU, in collaboration with other institutions, has been carrying out comprehensive training programs for indigenous peoples, and in so fulfilling the mandate of its members and stakeholders. Lo que queremos lograr es una visión crítica de las tecnologías, conocimiento sobre cómo manejarlas, para después apropiarlas y transformarlas en la medida en la que la comunidad quiere solucionar temas o lograr los sueños que se han propuesto. Want to know more? Visit our website, partner with us, and let us work together to leave no one behind and no one offline. Okay, well, that was a really beautiful video. Um, there have been some great questions. Um, did, Doreen, did you want to come on and answer a question right now? David, I think I'll, I'll, I'll jump in later as uh, okay. I know we're running slightly behind, but please go ahead. Okay, my apologies. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, it, yeah, we are running behind, but we're getting great stuff. So um, what we, we now are going to talk about is to how do we ensure that technology is people-centered and developed from the bottom up, very pertinent to the, to the so, so and, and also what does it mean for specific uh, target groups? So our next panelist, Michael Hoden, leads the Global Coalition on Aging. So Michael, what concrete actions do you think should be taken and can be taken to ensure access and accessibility uh, for the X ICTs for older people? which probably includes myself, by the way. Well, well, thank you, David. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to be part of this uh, extraordinary event. Uh, we, th we thank everyone. Uh, let me answer the question by reminding how you opened, David, which is, you said, here we are on Zoom. Uh, you know, Zoom was founded in 2011 by Eric Wan. Uh, as I understand it, an American uh, who came here from China. Uh, it is that innovation that has now enabled us to one of the platforms to be where we are during 2020 and now 2021 in this pandemic. The point I would suggest we all keep in mind is that innovation does not come out of the blue. It does not happen without both uh, policy, regulatory, and market support, and with funding. And it doesn't happen at a moment's notice. That's true of telehealth and telemedicine, which is another advance that we've seen on technology. So my most important message uh, is to remind us all about uh, the importance of innovation that is the cornerstone of access of technology for everyone, whether you're 22 or 90, whether you're a man or a woman, what part of the world you're from, we have to think of an ongoing support for innovation. Uh, David, should I continue? I see you're you're moving. Is that is that okay? No, I was moving because my wife let my dog the dog into the room, and I'm worried he's going to try to jump on my lap. Go ahead. All right. Well, I've left my yellow lab uh, next to me here, who's be behaving very nicely. Um, so I'd like to just make a few other points, particularly since it, this is only the second year that uh, older persons have been part of ITU in a more formal way. And as we all know, it's through the WISIS process, the World Summit on Information Society, uh, which of course is uh, starting now as well. 
Uh, number one, uh, literally, as we speak here, uh, we are also launching the Decade of Healthy Aging. Uh, the WHO, uh, sister organization to ITU, obviously, and the UN itself. And literally, um, one of the events that I missed this morning, because I'm here with all of us, is the first report on ageism out by the UN and the WHO, uh, which highlights the importance of the need for that uh, accessibility for all of us, again, whether we're 82 or 22. Secondly, um, to remind everyone that when we think about this quote unquote aging topic, even though in the UN we refer to older persons, there are really two elements to it. One, did, one is, yes, older persons. We will have 2 billion of us on the planet over 60 in the next couple of decades, 2 billion. So that's not like a small number and is it a very, is a very large percentage, which comes to the second point. Namely that there are more old than young in OECD countries and globally, which include all the countries uh, represented here. Uh, so the world uh, in the next decade or so, there will be more old than young. And so if we're thinking about fiscal sustainability for society, we have to think about the silver economy and think about it in terms of technology and ICTs. Technology and innovation are central to both of these major points around economic and fiscal sustainability and also around the enabling of access. Uh, and I guess a final point I would leave us all with is in general, Whatever you thought about older people is wrong. Uh, you know, older people come in many different forms and sizes. Uh, and if you think about, um, certainly in many societies around the world, Japan is a good example. We now have an expectation of a hundred year life. So if we think of this demographic as being from 60 to hundred, that's 40 years. That's like putting everyone from 20 to 60 together. Uh, David, you and I uh, might be a little different than uh, you know, a 90 year old uh, who may not have had access to uh, technology and innovation, but might very well do that. So we should think about the diversity of this demographic as well and the need that is utterly required. Uh, I will invite everyone on this uh, a webinar about panelists and participants uh, to join us at uh, WISIS. Uh, we have a hackathon, which is focused on this older person's track. Uh, we will have four platforms, one on dementia and Alzheimer's, which is one of the great needs of our time, uh, almost perfectly correlated with uh, aging, getting old. Uh, we'll have one on uh, uh, transportation and mobility. We will have one on FinTech and we'll have one on frailty. So please start hacking on all of those, sign up, get involved. For the first time ever, we will have a uh, WUSIS award on healthy aging innovation. Submit your technology. Uh, and I invite all of those here. And then our panels will be the week of April 12th, where of course we'll be communicating with you. But technology, innovation, digital inclusion, utterly central to all of our lives, whether we're 20, 60, 90, or older. And it is part of our participation in the economy, in society. How many of us have been to Zoom parties, weddings, unhappily funerals uh, over the last year? And it just shows that this virtual world has very much extended. Uh, I think there's a, there's a new piece of data that just came out that uh, roughly 60% of growth in um, online purchasing in uh, OECD countries anyway, have come from people 60 and older. Uh, wow. You know, we're streaming. So thank you very much. Uh, we welcome this uh, participation. 
and hope that we can engage with everyone through our Global Coalition on Aging, partnership with WISIS and ITU. Appreciate very much the opportunity. Great. Well, thank you so much, Michael. All of us old people need to start hacking more. Um, next, um, Monica Duhem uh, of Here Colors. Um, so what concrete actions do you think should be taken to ensure access and, and for the target group that you represent for the ICTs and the internet? Welcome. Thank you, David, and I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> thank you, David, and thank you for the ability for inviting me. First of all, I would like to highlight something particular about the target group I work with. When we hear catchphrases such as 40s are the new 30s, 60s the new 50s, we're making older adults invisible. On one hand, it's great because I just turned 37 with this new mathematics. But on the other hand, I still need glasses to read. I still have arthritis and it's not going to get any better. The past year, we have an accelerated pace to use in technology for every aspect of our life. And what I felt is I spent most of my time trying to catch up with technology instead of technology working for me. And don't take me wrong, I think ICTs are the best means to achieve and to empower us, especially when thinking about older adults, including myself. Technology is the best equalizer for opportunities and technology needs to be inclusive. So answering your question, David, about concrete actions to be taking to ensure access for older adults, I would say two basic things. On one hand, well, three, we talk about internet, that's for sure, but that's for everyone. If we do not have internet, we cannot participate in the digital economy. But ICT accessibility and technology appropriation. With age, we know that we have an increase and changes in our limitations. We have reduction of visual and hearing capacity. We have reduction of motor capabilities. So we really need to have accessible ICTs. For example, the online news subscription I use in, you know, in a shorter term, I will need to be able to increase the font size in order to be able to continue with my subscription. My hearing aid will be need to be compatible with my smart TV if I want to continue to entertain myself. So ICT accessibility for every product and service in the market is a must and we really need to, to tackle that. On the other hand, we need to promote the use of ICTs by older adults. And to being successful in promoting the use of technology, we need to construct confidence. Technology must be perceived as useful and easy to use. And we all know that it's not always the case. Although society is becoming increasingly tech savvy, there's still a digital divide between older and younger adults, and the division is usually specific to new technology. ICT are a catalyst for economic and social growth and will bridge to the outside world and we've living it this whole year. It's a bridge from the outside world, which minimizing impacts of isolation. Nevertheless, it is essential to create according to older person's needs. We need to include in the process of developing products and services older adults in order to achieve key inclusion in technology environment for healthy aging. Investing in healthy aging using ICTs is a scalable means to provide services and products. Michael told about the importance of healthy aging, but the well-being of the aging population translate in better mental and physical health and directly impacts costs, public and for the families. Finally, I read that the, in the ITU report on aging and Michael also talked about the silver economy. The value estimated of the silver economy is $17 trillion. Not bad incentive to be accessible and inclusive. So I bet that all the stores that today I am buying from online we want to keep me as a customer. And if they want me to keep them as a customer, we will need, really need to have accessible, usable, and inclusive technologies. Thank you very much, David. Thank you so much, Monica. Um, and uh, next, the last person in this segment, uh, Lizette Gonzalez Romero will be talking about telecommunications impact on indigenous communities in Mexico. Um, and she will be interpreted by Anna Sepulveda, 
who is uh, uh, one of the main organizers of this event. So um, welcome, Lisette, and tell us what, I, how ICTs can help the indigenous communities that, that you know so much about. ¿Qué tal? Buen día a todos. Quisiera com comenzar preguntándoles lo siguiente. Una pausa, Lisette, por favor. Hello, everybody. I would like to start asking you the following question. Have you ever wondered what type of technology or form of communication you want? Responder esta pregunta implica que adoptemos un enfoque crítico de la tecnología. Es decir, además de conocer cómo funciona. I'm going to translate that first. Sorry. Answering this question implies adopting a critical angle. Reflecting about how technology works. Go ahead. Adelante, por favor. Significa también pensar la tecnología como un hecho social, como resultado de una relación entre personas. It also means thinking about technology as a social good. It, thinks, it also means rethinking how we relate to each other. Y sobre todo, reflexionar cómo nos involucramos, cómo interactuamos, y cómo consumimos dichas tecnologías. And how we interact with it and how we actually use them. Repensar las tecnologías de esta manera nos hará capaces de elegir y de decidir cómo queremos usar esa tecnología. Rethinking technology in this way will make us able to make choices and take decisions, how we want to use them and why and in what way. Lo que significa entonces apropiárnosla, adecuarla a las necesidades de nuestros contextos, de nuestro territorio. Which also means owning it and adjusting them to the realities of our context and territories. En términos generales, esto nos ayudará a conseguir un buen vivir. In general terms, this also will help us ensure our quality of life, a better quality of life. Ante tal reflexión, propongo las siguientes acciones. I hereby propose the following actions. Primero, un mayor impulso a los proyectos comunitarios. First of all, I would like to see more efforts um, to promote community projects. Ya que estos están basados en una organización colectiva. This kind of projects are based on a collective organization. Desarrollan tecnologías libres. They also develop um, free technologies. Eh, hacen que el, que el conocimiento eh, se incremente y se potencia al compartirse. Which make that knowledge increases and um, gets bigger at the time that we share it. Implementan esquemas de economía solidaria y de respeto al medio ambiente. It also um, 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 encourage um, schemes based on the concept of um, an open economy that also is sustainable and respect um, the environment and natural resources. Y están íntimamente relacionados con procesos de defensa del territorio. And are very much um, related um, with the defense of the land and natural territories. En segundo lugar, propongo mejorar en cuanto a la accesibilidad. In second place, I also would like to address the issue of accessibility, improving accessibility. Yeah. Se ha avanzado mucho en cuanto a incrementar la conectividad o mejorar la banda ancha, pero hace falta garantizar el acceso a equipos actuales, no obsoletos. It's been uh, talked a lot about increasing access by increasing connectivity and improving bandwidth, um, but we also need to do efforts on um, getting more up-to-date equipment and fit-for-purpose equipment. Así como también equipos adecuados, es decir, a equipos que respondan a las diferentes necesidades de cada uno de los sectores que conforman la población. And also to adjust equipment to uh, the needs of different sectors of the population. Mejorar el tema también de la asequibilidad hacia estas tecnologías. Obviously, we need to make these technologies more affordable. Y sobre todo, Impulsar aún más los proyectos de formación y capacitación para las personas originarias de las comunidades rurales e indígenas. 
and we also need to enc encourage more training and capacity building, um, especially for the people who are um, originary from these communities and also indigenous peoples. Quien no conoce no puede decidir. Por eso es importante que estas personas aprendan, elijan y puedan apropiarse de estas tecnologías. Those who do not know cannot choose. Therefore, it is important that people also know so that they can appropriate and own these technologies. Finalmente, es muy importante también propiciar un entorno regulatorio adecuado para habilitar todas estas posibilidades. Last but not least, it's also very important to enable um, um, a, um, a, a regulatory environment that is appropriate for these technologies. Si pensamos en la comunicación como un derecho humano, if we think about communications as a human right, y en el espectro como parte de los territorios que habitamos, and in the spectrum as a part of our natural territories, construiremos tecnologías con un enfoque cada vez más humano. Muchas we're gracias. going to build technologies which are going to have a much more human focus. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lisette, and thank you, Anna, for helping there. Uh, um, before we move to our next segment, I just want to mention to all the speakers, we are running considerably late, so please be conscious of the time. Um, and now I'd like to bring Danola on to uh, let us know what we're hearing from the youth community that is joining us live. So, Danola, have you gotten any interesting comments or, or questions from that group? Yes, thank you so much to everyone that's been tweeting. I'm just going to highlight a couple. I know we're running um, short on time, but first, thank you to the UN Youth Envoy who tweeted right at the beginning. She um, said, you know, we're live now, join the third session of the Road to Addis event, um, connect to include, um, to discuss how to ensure that no one is left out when we bridge the digital divide with the transformative powers of ICTs. And then I can see some familiar faces tweeting as well from our Africa um, Generation Connect Youth Group. And we have Noha saying about the speech by Her Excellency, the President of Ethiopia, saying very powerful speech. Um, there were a lot of fans <laughs> of, 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 of that speech there. And she um, also was um, saying about Joanne's um, speech, um, agreeing that broadband will be essential, like electricity. But then she asked an open question, I guess, to us all. Um, do you think it will be achievable anytime soon in Africa? So very interesting there. We have our advocates who said, um, Post-COVID world digital exclusion impacts certain demographics more um, economically, educationally, socially, as well as their access to other opportunities. And um, also asked a very powerful question there: um, How could we have survived the connect? How could we have survived without connectivity during the pandemic? We're still in the pandemic. We're still trying to survive. So, <laughs> so, so we definitely need to think about that one. And finally, I I wanted to highlight um, a tweet by Valerie. Waswa, um, who was um, quoting something that um, Claudia Gordon said, She's, um, she said, um, access to ICT is more than a privilege. It should be a basic human right. Over to you, David. <laughs> Thank you so much, Danola. Love the energy of that community. Um, now we're going to continue with two additional panelists, uh, Professor Anthony Giannoumis, who is a big picture ICT expert based in Oslo. Uh, and uh, Roland White, who is head of global diversity at Microsoft. So let me start with you, Professor Giannoumis. Um, what are some examples of good solutions for digital inclusion and, and, and what can we learn from that? So um, my example is based on my job title, which is all about universal design. So universal design, not surprisingly, is what I'd advocate for here. It's the one kind of framework that we've discovered that can make digital solutions available to everyone equally. It started back in the 90s, but it has spread all over the planet. The UN has even mainstream universal design and all of their policies and programs. And under human rights law, countries around the world have an obligation to put universal design into practice. So what the hell is universal design? It all comes down to four key concepts. Number one, equality. What we want is for everyone to have access to use technology and use technology equally. But what we have are these huge digital divides that separate people into these different groups and categories. Doreen already mentioned people in rural environments, women and girls, 
But we, of course, also have to deal with this issue of disability, age. We have to deal with racial and ethnic minorities, all of whom experience disadvantages when it comes to accessing and using technology. So universal design is a framework for helping to close those digital divides. The second key concept here is diversity. Now we hear diversity a lot, everybody's talking about diversity, but diversity isn't just a checklist. It's not just a, oh, we have this person on the team, we have this person on the team. We have to recognize that diversity is about a person's complete identity. And that means we need to take an intersectional approach to understanding marginalization and disadvantage. What this comes down to is that a woman with a disability will experience barriers accessing and using technology because of her disability and her gender. And her experience will be very different than a man with a disability or a woman without a disability. Third key concept here is accessibility and usability. Now you might be thinking those are two different things. No, they are interconnected. It doesn't do anyone any good to have access to the internet if they cannot use a computer. And having access to a computer isn't helpful if you can't use the web. Number four, participation. Historically, technology was only usable for an elite group of technical experts. Now, we expect everyone to be able to use technology. And it used to be like that with technology development. Technology developers used to be an elite group of people who had highly technical skills, but now anyone with a base level of digital skills can create technology on their own. So ensuring that we have a diverse group of people who are contributing to the ways that technologies are created is critical for universal design. Now I live and work in Norway. Here, universal design is part of our human rights. And on May 28th, we're celebrating the first annual Universal Design Day. And you can find out more about this in our network of universal design professionals at our website, universal.design. Thank you, David. Thank you so much, Anthony. Um, and I had a barking dog that I've had removed. Yay. Uh, Roland, uh, tell us what you've learned as head of global diversity at Microsoft about digital inclusion. Yeah, so thanks. And I think this is a brilliant partnership here because uh, you call it universal design, we call it inclusive design. It, it's the same thing in the name. So um, when Satya started in Microsoft um, five years ago, uh, we evolved our mission statement to empower every person and organization on the planet to achieve more. Um, and that's not just our customers, but the customers of our customers but more importantly, those people with zero access to technology. And just like we've seen in the chat room, it's almost like a human right. Electricity, food, water, broadband, all of these things are, are becoming essential for everybody and people shouldn't be limited based on where they live. So one of the things that Microsoft is very passionate about is to ensure that we help enable people through technology around the world and we actually create additional ways for people to use technology and improve their lives. So we also don't believe that there should be levels of privilege in technology. So one of the things I know, I know we've spoken about Teams today, but I actually wanted to kind of like talk about Office 365 and Skype. We have inclusive design in everything we build. So we do not believe in meeting a criteria. We believe in blasting that criteria out the water. But the challenge is people don't know about this stuff because they don't challenge themselves to use it. You know, you might have an iPhone, you might have a phone, you only try to stretch to your where you want to explore, but you don't actually practice dictating your emails or actually having your emails dictated to you. You don't practice pinch and zoom when you can't read a menu, etc. Within Office 365, within Teams, all of our products are I, I don't like to use the word fully accessible because everything can be more accessible, but highly accessible with many, many features. And we do this as a standard and we encourage people to use it because also as users of our products, you're also part of, part of the design criteria because within our inclusive design mentality, we invite you to tell us what can be better. So for example, many of the uh, disabled the communities, but within uh, the African-American um, African American and Caribbean background were talking to us about some of the facial recognition prop challenges within using cameras and some of the difficulties they were having using some of the eye gaze technology. 
And so this is where input from users is critical for our inclusive design. The last part of this, though, is about giving back to society and changing society. You were talking a bit about the older generation. I still count myself as a young man. I hope to anyway. But unless all of us on, get on this community actually start going into schools and colleges and with parents and teaching about this from day one, we will continue to have this stigma over the next generations. So Microsoft give loads of free training available on our websites around coding for girls that code, minorities that code, get even getting back into work around cloud and AI. But it's just break the stigma of these things. Show what's possible using technology instead of how it's restricted. And then we'll get to the value of we believe in Microsoft that actually a disability is caused when there's a mismatch between human requirements and technology. And all of us have that ability to actually create everything to an ability and make the world better for everybody. So thank you for asking. Thank you so much, Roland. And Microsoft's doing so many impressive things these days. Thank you for being here. Now, I'd like to bring back on screen um, our good friend, Sango. So uh, Sango, what have you got for us this time? Now we're going to watch a video on how the pandemic is pushing more and more children to learn from home and how important that online protection is. Let's roll the video. At the peak of the pandemic, more than 190 countries closed the doors of their schools to 94% of learners worldwide, creating the largest mass disruption of education in history. Many governments reacted with an overnight shift to online learning. But the reality is that globally, two in three children and young people do not have access to the internet at home. Those children were disproportionately impacted by the global shutdowns as they were unable to continue their education and those lucky enough to have connectivity at home had to adjust to new ways of learning, socialising and in many cases to an increased exposure to online risks and potential harms. Safe digital access of all children to the online environment must be a top national priority. For many years, child online protection has been at the top of ITU's agenda. ITU's Child Online Protection Guidelines provide a comprehensive set of recommendations on how to contribute to the development of a safe and empowering online environment for children and young people. To protect children online, we need data, new technologies, harmonized frameworks, international cooperation and increased investment. We also need global awareness. And more importantly, we need to listen to children and young people. They must be part of the solution. What is your country doing to protect children and young people online at school and at home? What is your sector doing for a safer and child-friendlier internet? What is the global community doing to endorse and implement the COP guidelines? And what can you do to ensure safe learning never stops? Okay, well, thank you, Sango, for that powerful video. And uh, just to, to our next guest, I'm, I'm really happy to welcome um, Hans Vestberg. Um, has been working so hard on many of the issues that we've been hearing about today. And I'd really like to welcome you, Hans. It's terrific to see you here and to be here with you. Um, you're leading an unprecedented effort to achieve digital inclusion for all, which began in January at the World Economic Forum's Davos Dialogues. So tell us about the Edison Alliance and what you're working on. Thank you, David. And um, thank you all for such a great contribution during this discussion. Uh, uh, we all know, and we've heard of all the speakers that the pandemic, the pandemic has such a tremendous impact on our society. I would like to focus on two. One is, of course, uh, that we have been set back when it comes to achieving the sustainable development goals. We have been set back because of economical uh, pandemic and all of that, which is just uh, extremely tough. The second one I want to focus on is that 
We have leapfrogged, and we've heard it from so many. We have leapfrogged probably five to seven years in the digitalization. Things that we have been talking of, they happen immediately when this pandemic came out. So there has never been more important to be connected, and all speakers have been talking about that. But still, we have 3.6 billion people that are not connected uh, in the world. So it's a big challenge to get access to what I call the 21st century's infrastructure, mobility, broadband, and cloud. And we are actually running the risk to actually increasing the digital divide, and that will hit the most vulnerable. And that's what we heard from many of the previous speakers, that this is going to hit for people that is very vulnerable in this situation. Because in the future, and already now, if you're not connected, you're not part of our society, you cannot get access to training, to education, to, wor to working from home, to healthcare, and just being connected to your friends. So I think this is the moment where we need to understand the challenge. And I heard it from several of you, it's a three-folded challenge. It's the accessibility of the technology. It's the affordability. And it's the usability, devices and application that is really supporting it. And that's why we decided to work with the World Economic Forum and, and, and make a platform of a multi-stakeholder, uh, multi-sector, private, public initiative, because it's not only one organization that can solve this. It has to be several different using it in order to scale the digitalization across the globe. And a single mission for the Edison Alliance is actually to uh, increase the digital inclusion in our society worldwide. And uh, uh, we will focus initially uh, on health, education and financial inclusion. And we have experts in all these areas represented both from public and private sector in order to scale this and actually advocate and find the best solution. Not maybe invent all the things, but scale them across borders. And we have heard of many good examples here that can be scalable. And the problem we have today is that we don't know how much good solutions there are out there and how we can do it. So that's what we're doing. We have a multi-year program that's going to go over several years. We have put up tough targets for ourselves to achieve and improve. And of course, we work with all important organizations like ITU, the Broadband Commission, GSMA, uh, from the technology point of view, that can already have done quite a lot. So we're encouraged about, we have people from all these sectors coming in, public and private, to help to doing this. So I'm encouraged, and I always talked about, we needed the 18th goal of the sustainable development goals, and that's actually connectivity. Now we don't have an 18th goal, but we have an enormous force and platform and an understanding how important the digital inclusion is in our society to be part of it. And it should matter where you're born, where you live and where you come from. You should have the same opportunities. We have our chance in a lifetime because everybody understands the importance of this infrastructure right now and to doing what we need to do. And I can only echo what Doreen said and many others have said, uh, connectivity is a <clears throat> basic human right. And it's more important than now than ever. So that's what we focus on in the Edison Alliance. We have kicked it off in the beginning of the year. And I said, it's a multi-year uh, work that we will do together with World Economic Forum. Thank you so much, Hans. I think in the six years since the goals were adopted, the consciousness of the importance of connectivity has really changed. I'm sure if they were being adopted now, there would be an 18th goal on connectivity. No question, not 9B or whatever the heck it is. But we understand now, and your leadership has been valuable. I'm sure many people here will be getting behind the Edison Alliance's work. So thank you for joining us. Great to see you. Thank you, David. Um, now I'd like to invite Doreen jo to join us again uh, and talk a little bit about a key element for achieving so much of what we talked about today, and that is partnerships. So um, Doreen, what's, what are some examples of partnerships for uh, digital inclusion? And after Doreen speaks, we'll hear from Otman on the same topic. So Doreen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, David. And it, it's a great moment to jump in because Hans has sort of just set this up for me by citing some really good examples that are out there from the Broadband Commission to the Edison Alliance. Um, I would say that there's growing recognition that partnership needs to be right at the center, as Hans was saying, of every digital development strategy. I think that's what the UNSG was, uh, was advancing with the launch of the Digital Cooperation Roadmap. Um, 
of course, for the ITU partnership, I think is at the heart of our work. Uh, it's in our DNA. We're the only UN agency that actually has private sector membership. And I think it's critical uh, to the effectiveness of, of our work here at the ITU, bringing governments, private sector, academia, and, and civil society together. So whether it's our Smart Village 2.0 initiative, I wanna mention with the government of Niger, a range of partners from the UN, from the private sector, civil society, which is bringing innovative, meaningful and accessible digital solutions to villages in Niger by taking a holistic approach that makes the digital platforms the real foundation for health services, for education, agricultural management practices, and much more. Another great example, and, and, and Pumzili noted it, our Equals Global Partnership, and many of you are, are, are part of it, co-founded by the ITU, UN Women, ITC, GSMA, and UNU, and now counting over 100 partners, and we work together to help women get access to ICTs, be better equipped with digital skills, to benefit from greater leadership opportunities in the digital sector. And then lastly, I want to mention our, our GIGA initiative with UNICEF and others uh, to connect every school on the planet to the internet and every young person to information, opportunity, and choice. And this effort is, is critically important now, as we've heard about the challenges that learners are facing because of the lack of, of connectivity. So these are just some examples, David. They're bearing fruit, and I would like to invite you to join us so that together we can make universal digital inclusion a reality. Thank you, back to you. Thanks, Doreen. It is inspiring, the number of partnerships that are emerging, and we just heard about a major one from Hans, as you said, and there's so many others. The GIGA initiative is great too. Um, Otman, uh, Otman Almar from the MISC Foundation, uh, tell us from your perspective, what is the importance of partnerships for us to achieve some of these great things we're talking about in, in this program today? And welcome. Uh, thank you. Hi, David. Hello, everyone on the call. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, I know that uh, currently we are over the time schedule, um, but I would like to double click on what Doreen has mentioned earlier, which is really the emphasis on actually engaging and partnering with the people. And more specifically, and within my experience, is young people. Now, what we know generally is that young people are digital natives. What we don't know, or perhaps many of us don't know, is that young people actually constitute approximately 50% of the world population. And 90% of young people live in developing countries. And what it means to be a young person has shifted drastically in COVID. Before COVID, what it means to be young was actually very difficult, being young at, uh, before, before COVID. And that is, includes education, employment, mental health, and many other challenges. After COVID, the challenges have not only become dire, they have become critical. And yet, the one way where these young people could be catalyzed and prepared for the future is through digital inclusion. Now, my experience specifically last year was I was a chair of the Youth 20 Engagement Group. And in the Youth 20 Engagement Group, I had the role of bringing in 77 different delegations from 23 different countries and international organizations and submitting together our own communique, which is basically a document including the policies that would, we would like as young people in G20 countries to be included to world leaders. And foremost among that was digital inclusion and representation. But this all would not have happened if the G20 countries have not come together. And therefore the role of partnership is ridiculously important because it removes redundancies, it increases synergies, and brings about many voices. Now, there are, for example, within the G20 infrastructure or group, there is a group called the Digital Economy Task Force. They focus a lot on the ITU's message and delivery. And I would like to end with thanking the ITU for partnering with young people on their Generation Connect Advisory Board. Thank you. Thank you, Adman. Um, it really is fantastic, the, the variety of people we've had here today on, on this conversation about such a critical set of issues. And I do think the human element has really been coming out. So thank you to Doreen and everyone for organizing it. Now, we're, gonna we're close to finishing here, but as we've done in the past, 
we're going to ask each panelist to tell us in just one word what they would like to see coming out of the WTDC conference. So uh, I'm going to go through and ask each of them just to quickly give us their word. So Doreen, let's start with you. Uh, I'm going to say leadership, leadership, leadership. Okay. Emil say. Transformation. Thank you. Emma. Action. Action with Mike on. Thank you. Uh, Joanne. Access is my word. Good word. Judith. Impact. Thank you. Michael. Innovation. Nice. Monica. Awareness. Good. Lisette. Lisette, por favor, puedes encender tu micrófono. Oh, Zoom sometimes does that. I've seen, <laughs> Zoom often can be frustrating. Lisa, tu palabra, por favor, para la pregunta. Eh, en una palabra, por favor, ¿qué quieres ver salir de la conferencia de, eh, de mundial de telecomunicaciones en Etiopía, por favor? Let's, estás, let's, estás con el let's try to come back to Lisa in a second. Uh, okay. Roland? Uh, curiosity. Oh, we've got a great variety of words. Otman. Representation. Thank you. Hans. I think Hans is still with us. Maybe not. Uh, he was here till just a second ago. Oh, well, he's a big CEO, so that's understandable. Uh, Anthony. Uh, universal design, all one word. <laughs> that's a, that's cheating, but I think we'll allow it. Uh, and Lisette, have you gotten your mic on yet? Lisette me me escribe por chat que el computador está eh, un poco congelado, pero me escribió por chat su give, palabra. Maybe you can give your word to Anna in the chat. Yes, yeah, sí, accessibility. Accessibility. So she told me her computer is frozen. Her word is accessibility. Okay. Well, thank you, Lisette. All right. So. So what, then, then Anna has the great challenge of putting together a word cloud really fast using all those words. And while she's doing that, I'd like to turn the floor back to Doreen for her closing remarks. Uh, thank you, David, and, and thank you, everyone. This has been really a, a, an amazing session. I think we had almost 400 participants at, at one point, and I know hundreds and hundreds following live on, on Twitter, YouTube, and, and LinkedIn. So thank you, everyone. It's been amazing, and I've learned so much. Um, David, just my, my perhaps my quick takeaways, the importance of a people-centered approach. We heard that from the very beginning from the Ethiopian president herself. Leaving no one behind in the digital world means ensuring that technology is people-centered. Uh, Joanne stressed uh, the endless opportunities that tech has opened for her. Uh, those that invest in tech uh, should be thinking about it, about the human aspects. She said broadband is as vital as motorways. Uh, that's great, Joanne. Monica uh, spending most of her time, as, as she noted, all of us do, trying to catch up with tech uh, rather than tech working for us. I hear you. Thank goodness I have tech savvy children. Uh, tech needs to be inclusive was, was Monica's point, and we need to be thinking about the needs of older adults while we're developing technology. Uh, we heard from many the importance of communications as a right, as a human right. Uh, Lizette also mentioned spectrum as part of our territories. Uh, we're going to build technologies that have much more human focus. Uh, Claudia, access to ICTs is more than a privilege. It should be considered a right. Uh, George, diverse groups of people contributing to the way tech is created. Uh, this is necessary for universal design, or as Microsoft calls it, inclusive design. Uh, Judith, diversity is our reality. Inclusion is a choice. That's great. Uh, Claudia, we must not in it, we must innovate. Sorry, not for persons with disabilities, but with. And I think David, we heard that with 
uh, throughout that we can't be developing things for people, but with them, regardless of uh, whether it's a gender issue or a disability issue, uh, an elderly person uh, issue, that inclusive development and design is absolutely critical. Michael stressed innovation uh, as the cornerstone for access to technology for everyone. Uh, Roland, all of us have the ability to contribute uh, to that ability and make the, the, the world work better for everyone. I love that. Uh, and Hans, this is the moment. I stress this is the moment. Uh, the importance of partnerships, the uh, affordability, accessibility, usability, and of course that 18th SDG, which is the hidden SDG uh, connectivity that cuts across the other 17 goals. Othman, again, linked to partnerships, working together and bringing that fundamental view from the youth. Uh, and again, thank you so much, everyone. It's been amazing. Thank you for the great comments in the chat, the questions. I think, David, we had representation from, uh, from all parts of the world, all time zones, and I really want to thank everyone. Back to you, David. OK, thank you, Doreen. And I made a mistake. Uh, and there's so many people here to manage. My apologies. But we missed two people with their words. Darn. OK. First of all, Danola, I hope you're still out there. Please come on and tell us your word. My word was transformation, but I wanted to highlight the most popular word that came out when we did a survey with the Generation Connect Africa Youth Group, and that was inclusion. <laughs> inclusion is a very good word. And Claudia also, I hope Claudia is still here so I can ask her for her word. And my apologies to Claudia for leaving you out. <laughs> uh, my word is representation. And someone else already said it, so it did get added to the cloud. Um, well, that means it'll be I, bigger in the cloud. I, I would say relatable. So I guess maybe, how about if we say meaningful representation? <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, and my apologies for the delay. Now, uh, I want to go to Jim Rogers so that Jim can show us what he's been doing. Remember, he's been drawing this entire time. So show us your drawing, Jim. Uh, and somebody else has to see my dog, but he's gone now, so sorry about that. Um, but uh, if, if Jim is here, uh, come on, I know Jim is here, so let's see his screen. Okay, here we go. Uh, here we go. So tell us about that, Jim. Uh, yeah, it was a really great session. There was a lot of great points, but some of the most important things that stood out to me were... Um, ITC should be a right and not a privilege. Uh, they must be affordable. Uh, we need to construct confidence. Accessibility should be for all, whether you're 62 or 22. Yeah, uh, and uh, the big one for me with the two in three children have no broadband access while 190 countries have schools closed. It was a really big one for me. Yeah, I think it's a great session, some great points. Mm -hmm. And, and this graphic will be available after the fact, as, as will the whole video of this session. Um, it's amazing what you can capture in one image, Jim. So thank you for that. I really uh, am impressed at, the, your, at your talents and also fitting it exactly into the space allotted. Yeah. Thank um, you. There's now, a lot of ideas to, uh, to put in there. Everyone had a lot of good input, but I, I think I just about got there. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, I'm told Anna is ready with the word cloud. She's very fast. So let's see the word cloud, Anna. Thank you so much, Jim. And just so you know, this the word cloud that we're about to see is, is going to continue growing with every event on the road to Addis. Uh, and it will be compiled by the end and presented at WTDC in Addis Ababa in November. So uh, remind everybody, our next stop on this road to Addis will be April 28th, where we'll be talking uh, particularly about financing, uh, super important, maybe not quite as uh, powerful as today, because today was so much about the people, as I said, but financing without it, we cannot make these great human things possible. So that's going to be a super important session. And I hope you'll all come. And I guarantee you that the wonderful people who've been working on this will make that fascinating as well. So there's the word cloud from today. Accessibility, our biggest word. Transformation. Wow. Beautiful, and, and the word cloud continues to grow. So thank you all.
for being here. Thank you for allowing me to participate and see you on April 28th and especially hope to see you in November in Addis Ababa. I hope I didn't forget anything else. Thank you all so much. Have a great time wherever in the world you may be. And thank you, David. 